Thanks for joining us for the message. We see this as the central part of our worship service. We'll have someone from our congregation read the passage and jump right into the text. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that, would, that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves, their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Thank you, Mariah. Good morning. When God isn't like you thought, if you haven't turned there yet, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 11 is where we're going to be. And if you haven't figured out where it is yet, if you know where the New Testament begins, turn left about five books. You'll find the little book of Habakkuk. I'm not going to make you spell it, although I was tempted to as a group. All right, my notes, I just find myself putting Hab, all right, H-A-B. So if you want to do that, you can. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord God, may we submit ourselves to it this morning as we seek to submit our lives to you. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be more in awe of who you are this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Now, think in your minds for a moment about what your life was like. January 14th today, but think about what your life was January 14th, 2020. Okay, you go back in your mind, and then what was your life like then? And if someone was going to tell you then, hey... In about two months or so, the whole world is going to shut down. You're not going to be going to work. You're not going to be going to the store. You're not going to be going to the restaurants, and we're going to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what's going to happen as far as how it's going to impact not just us, but the whole globe? I mean, you experienced it, what that was like. If someone were to tell you that that's about to happen in a couple months, you wouldn't have believed them, right? I know I wouldn't have. I would have said, hey, keep watching those zombie movies. All right, because, man, that's a little unrealistic. And think about all the impact that it's had. It's the same with if you go back in your mind, if someone had told you before 9-11 that 9-11 was going to happen, you would have said, I don't, I don't believe you. This is, this is probably not going to happen. You, couldn't, you wouldn't have been able to, to fathom what was going to happen. And here in Habakkuk 1, last week, Matt introduced the book, and it was, it was Habakkuk's prayer and cry out to God. But here we see God responds to his, to his plea. Look what God says to Habakkuk in Habakkuk 1, verse 5. He says, Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Here, God says right away, hey, I'm going to do something that you can't even fathom if I told you. And the big, one of the big first takeaways that we need to see here is that God says, hey, I want you to know that even though you think I'm not doing anything, I'm doing something. He says, I am doing something. And even if I told you about it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. And next week, we're going to see how Habakkuk he doesn't believe it after God tells him what he's doing, all right? Not to get ahead of ourselves too much 
for next week. But what's important, what's amazing is the fact that God answers Habakkuk's prayer. He answers. And in this first verse of verse 5, we see that he's doing something. And God says, you were worried, right? You were complaining that I, I wasn't doing anything about the injustice that was going on. But he is doing something, and it's something that is about to blow Habakkuk's mind. And maybe it'll blow our mind a little bit when we go into the details about what God is doing. But God is at work, even though Habakkuk can't see it. He's frustrated before this. He's praying and crying out to God because he can't see what God is doing. And graciously, God starts to reveal, hey, I'm, I'm working. And usually that's how it is for us. When we don't feel like God is working in our lives or the situations that we're dealing with, God is always working. He's always working. He's always seeking to draw us and draw others to himself. And when we pray, it's important to remember that when we pray, sometimes God might already be working on the things that we're praying to him about. He might already be working on it. But he wants us to pray. He wants us to increase our, our faith and dependence on him through prayer. And here in this, in this book, Habakkuk the prophet, he, is, he had gotten to the end of, of himself. God had commissioned him as a prophet to call people back to righteous living for the Lord. And he was frustrated. And he got to the point where he was at the end of himself. And all he could do was cry out to God, God, wh why aren't you doing anything? And that's a good place for us to be in life. When we go through frustrations to, to come to the end of ourselves. So he prays. Justice had been perverted. There was no consequences for injustice. There was no accountability for the injustices that were going on. But he takes his frustrations and he takes them to God. And Matt did a great job last week opening up the book to us in Habakkuk and and emphasize this idea that God wants to know our frustrations. See, sometimes we feel like, I, I can't even, I don't know if I can be honest with God about the frustrations that I have that are going on in my life, but he, he, wants, he wants to hear those things. And so we should go to him. And God helps us in the process of wrestling with him to embracing him, from wrestling with to embracing. And Matt did a great job explaining that last week, even to the point where I thought, well, we can be done with Habakkuk. Let's just move on to the next sermon series, right? If you haven't listened to it, you need to go back and listen to the sermon last week introducing Habakkuk. But I think it's important for us as we, we go through this book that we participate with Habakkuk in his in his wrestling with God. It's something that we can all relate to. That we are part of the tension. We feel the tension that he goes through. As he wrestles with God. The process. And right now he's in this process of. He's in the, the, wrestling, the wrestling phase. Where it's challenging his faith. And hopefully all of our faiths this morning are challenged to where our faith has grown and increased in our almighty, our mighty God. And so, God answers. But when God answers Habakkuk's prayer, it probably wasn't when he wanted to be answered, right? From about the time when you could, you look at the history of when Israel or Judah began to decline morally again. It could have been up to as far as 20 years where Habakkuk is seeking to call people back to him. So the answer might not have been, we read it the next verse, but it might not have been right away. And usually sometimes when God answers, he answers prayer, but it's probably not when we want him to answer it. But here we're about to see that Habakkuk finds that answered prayer is usually not always the answer that we want either, or the answer that we think that we need. And Habakkuk is about to find out that his problems were probably bigger than he thought. Look with me 
in verse 6. It says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. And right now, right away after reading this verse, we see that there's an ethical dilemma of God's character. An ethical dilemma of God's character. See, the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians, if you've ever heard of the Babylonians, they're the same people. All right, the Chaldeans is like the more general term. Babylonians are more specific of like their main city that was Babylon. Okay? And this is where, uh, like in modern southern day Iraq, all right, that's the geographic location if you know where Iraq is. Uh, and what's interesting, a uh, side note about, about the land of the Chaldeans, if you remember Abraham, when God chose Abraham and called him out of the city of Ur in the land of the Chaldeans, and he called him to the promised land, and he, and he made a covenant with him. And here we'll see how one of the biggest judgments God's going to bring them back into this foreign land. But I think we're most familiar with the Babylonians or the Chaldeans through the book of Daniel. All right, Daniel, the lion's den, Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar, all right, when Judah goes into exile. All right, you see, that's what's next. All right, so you kind of see what's happening here, and God's starting to reveal it to Habakkuk. And if you like spoilers, all right, just read the last chapter of Second Chronicles, all right, and you can see how it all goes about where they go into exile. And this is... God is revealing these things to Habakkuk here in verse 6. But what's important about the Chaldeans to know is that they were a pretty intelligent people. Babylon had become kind of like an intellectual hub for the, the Middle East at the time. And they were into astrology and astronomy. And they were smart. They were smart people. They had great weaponry that was beyond the technology of their modern age, and so they were just able to dominate and take over people. They, they were violent people. They weren't, afraid to, they weren't afraid to torture their enemies, and I won't get into too many of the gruesome uh, facts, but you use your imagination, and they weren't afraid to do it to whatever it took to take over their enemy that they were trying to capture. So they, they were a ruthless, arrogant, godless, brutal people, prideful, wickedly seeking to expand their own dominion. L listen to what God says about them. He gives a description of them starting in verse 7. He says of the Chaldeans, they are dreaded and fear fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from, from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They, they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. And at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Verse 11, then they sweep by like the wind and go on guilty men whose own might is their God. Their own might is their God. And, if, you know, as, as we hear this and we think about Habakkuk hearing this from God, you know, God's saying, hey, like you've heard about this, uh, this new superpower that's being raised up, the Babylonians that are taking over everyone kind of in the far east. They're, they're fierce. You know, I'm allowing this to happen for you. He's saying, I'm allowing this people to be raised up because they're coming for you. To give judgment to rebellious Judah. And if we're honest, what we think about God, I think that can be an ethical dilemma of what we think about God. Maybe God's not like we thought. And I think Habakkuk may be going through this similar Dilemma. He says, whoa, 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 like, God, you're about to send this wicked nation that is so against you, more wicked than Judah, to judge 
Judah? Like, how does this, how does this make, make sense? They don't serve Yahweh, they serve themselves. They're impressed in awe with, with themselves. And how can God bring justice about to a disobedient people who are more disobedient than they? A nation more in need of God's justice. God, I could understand if you were going to bring judgment to these people, send you know, fire and brimstone down and destroy Babylon, but you're going to use them to, to judge us. It's like, whoa, I know we deserve judgment, God. Like, I know we've been really bad. I've been, remember, I, I know I, all those things I was saying about, like, wow, I was really frustrated about Judah and the justice. Like, well, maybe it wasn't as extreme as I thought. Right? Put yourself in, in Habakkuk's, in Habakkuk's shoes. Like, wow, I thought God was more loving. I thought God was more gracious. I thought God was more patient than that. It seems erroneous, doesn't it? So the first ethical dilemma we saw last week in the first few verses where Habakkuk was frustrated because God wasn't acting as he believed that he should in really what he knew about God's character. And now we see that God says, no, 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 you were right. That is my character. I am just. But then a new dilemma, a second one comes up, and it's that God was God was acting, but he was acting in a way that seemed unlike God to Habakkuk. It's how God chooses to act. Like, this doesn't seem like, like God. So what do we do when, when God isn't like we thought? You ever experienced that? What do we do when we think that God isn't like we thought? Well, we have to look quickly at some of the questions of, questions of the heart. All throughout time, philosophers, theologians, they've narrowed down these questions that every human being has and is longing for. Right? That's about identity, like, like, who am I? Why am I here? What is, what is my purpose? What is, what is the meaning of life? And one of the big ones is, God, if God is good, why does he allow evil? And why does he not do anything about evil in the world? Uh, those are things that people and Christians and people of faith, they, they, we wrestle with. Because it's hard for us to grapple our minds around the, the vastness of God's plan and His work in our, limited, in our limited perspective. Like, how can God allow bad things to happen if He's, if he's a loving God, if He's a, a sovereign God? And I think it's important for all of us to, to embrace and to wrestle with some of those questions, but let me just be quick to tell you that as Christians, man, we have it good from a God who created us, who knows us, who created us for identity, who created us for purpose, and to know Him, and to trust Him, and all of these questions, all these desires of the heart, they're all found in Jesus, the Messiah, who has come and taken the place for us and is, is through his death and resurrection and the hope that we have a future is, is, is making all things new. Amen? And gives us an, a purpose and an identity now and a faith and a hope that he's changing these things, that he's involved in the, the negative things that we see in, in a rebellious and wicked world that has rejected God and the consequences that come from that and the consequences of our own sin, our own life, and how we deal with that. God, God is involved, and God is here to help us, and God is here to lead us towards Him and to cast our eyes towards Him in the future. And many times our view of God can be challenged because of the circumstances that are around us. Our view of God often comes from the level that we've wrestled with some of these, these questions in our, our understood May I add limited perspectives, which is humbling, right? But many people are tempted to have a small view of God based upon their perspective or things that have happened to them. How could have God allow this to happen to me? How people have treated them. And we say that God is near to the brokenhearted. God is near to us when things happen to us that we don't understand how God would allow those things to happen. So there's this temptation to make conclusions 
about who God is based upon our experiences. I say, well, maybe God doesn't really care. Maybe God doesn't really, maybe God doesn't really see. So, but when, when, we, when we find or we think to find that God isn't like we thought he was, may we seek God. May we pursue him. May we challenge him at his word, even as Habakkuk did. We can criticize Habakkuk for his lack of faith, but I think he had a great amount of faith to say, God, this doesn't match up, and I know you're consistent. I know you're good. I know you're just. And so we have to wrestle with these things in prayer, just like Habakkuk did, and go to his word. So we also see how there's an expectation of God's character. Secondly, that Habakkuk, see, see Habakkuk, he was a prophet, he was a man of God. He, he knew all the things about God. He had, a, he had right doctrine. He had right understanding. You know, his expectations, though, I think were perhaps could have been based on some empirical evidence. Right before this time, before Judah was declining, okay, uh, there was this young king named Josiah. You ever hear of Josiah? He was eight years old when he was crowned king. I know some of you have kids eight or around the age of eight. Can you imagine if they became king, uh, president of the United States? All right, you're like, Lord, please no, right? <laughs> but he became king, and what's amazing about Josiah is that he was righteous and that he pursued God. And God revealed his word to him, and he was convicted by his word, and, and he challenged, and he, he tore down all the different um, places of worship, of pagan worship and of idolatry in the high places, and he, he crumbled all those things, and, and there was this great revival that happened in Judah, and it was exciting, right? Well, Habakkuk most likely was alive during this time. It wasn't too much earlier, and so he experienced this. But then, unfortunately, when Josiah died... <coughs> Judah began to decline again morally, spiritually. They, they went right back to their old ways and started, started living uh, and worshiping uh, as the pagans did. And so they went right back to their old ways. And the answer I would assume that Habakkuk was probably expecting when, like, God, why don't you do something, is that how, how would God deal with the paralyzed law? How would he heal that? Well, he would probably send a, a king, a new king, or bring a revival to the king, and, and, and that king would enforce, just like Josiah did, to enforce, hey, we need to worship God. He was, experience, he, he was thinking, God, I want you to experience another revival. We need a revival in Judah. I think that's exactly probably what Habakkuk was thinking was about to happen, that he was calling out to God, hey, God, do something about it. He expected God to act kindly and graciously. Because he had experienced this. But I think we have to be careful because when we lean on our own knowledge from our experience alone and not God, we can think we've figured God out. And that's, that's a dangerous, it can be a dangerous place to be. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, NLT puts it like this. It says, my thoughts, this is God saying, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So he was frustrated, but God's ways are higher than his ways. And I'm thankful, and hopefully you are, that God's ways are higher than ours. And we don't understand, we can, we can have faith and trust that God's ways are best. But I think most of all this passage in Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11 is an exposure to God's character. It's an exposure to God's character. And if you get anything out of this message, I hope that you get that God is bigger than you think. God is bigger than you think. He's bigger than I think. He's bigger than all that we think. And may God increase our knowledge and understanding that He is bigger than we think this morning. You know, Habakkuk, he was, saying, he was saying, you're not doing anything about justice. It doesn't seem like, you know, you. And God says, yeah, that's true, but I, I am just. But I'm, I'm probably more just than you think I am, right? I'm more just than you think I am because I'm going to send the Chaldeans to come and judge Judah. 
Not only is he more just, I think all of God's attributes are bigger than we think. God is more sovereign than we think. He's in control of history. And things may seem that things are out of control of God's grasp, out of his reach, but I guarantee you they're not. He is sovereign, almighty God. God is intimately involved in what goes on in history. That doesn't mean that God's always the one to blame, but when he allows things to happen, he has purpose and he has reason and he has overreach on on what is happening. And maybe God is allowing negative things to happen to serve a greater purpose that we don't even realize in our own lives and the people around us and, and beyond. But I think it's important to remember that one of God's main concerns in His sovereignty and control over history is for His own people. For His own people. And maybe God wants to allow things to happen in our lives and our families in our nation, in our, in our world, to wake Christians up. That we would have a thirst and a hunger for righteousness. That we would live out our faith to be salt and light the way that, that God is calling us to be. But not only is He more sovereign than we think, I, I would argue that God is wiser than we think. He is way more wiser. <laughs> I know that's not proper grammar, but He is wiser than we think. And God knows what is best. He's the creator. He knows what's, what's good for us. We can't know everything about God, but that's why we have faith and we trust him. And God gives us the grace sometimes, as he did Habakkuk, where he reveals things to us. And I think even in hard things that we don't want God to reveal to us after he re reveals it to us, to increase our faith and our trust. You know, Job 38, if you know the story of Job, he goes through all the difficulties and at a certain point, God kind of lays into him and he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Right? Where were you? I'm bigger than you think. Think. So when bizarre things happen to us in life, I think we need to ask ourselves some questions. What, does God want to do? what is God trying to do in my life? When bizarre things happen, what is God trying to do in my life? Why is God allowing this? And what needs to change? Am I living as a part of his kingdom or am I seeking to live for myself and I'm, I'm deceiving myself? So I think when we're tempted to ask the questions, is God really loving? Is God really just? We need to really first question our own hearts. Is there selfishness? Is there anger? Is there pride? their self-deceit. And here, as we look about the big story of Judah and Israel, God's intention, by the way, is restoration. God's intention is for us to operate in his kingdom. If we're not, he's going to call us back to that. And he wants to increase our faith for his glory. And so when God isn't like you thought, he's better than you thought. He may not be like we maybe want him to be or like him to be, but he's far better. He's far better. God is bigger than you think. Turn to your neighbor real quick, all right? Wake him up. Say, God is bigger than you think. Oh, that wasn't very good. Turn to your other neighbor. Try again, all right? You're not convinced. Say, God is bigger than you think, all right? Amen. God, God, is, God is bigger than than you think. And he's also more patient than you think. You think, well, God wasn't very patient with Judah. He was super patient with Judah. So much to the point that God waited and waited and waited, gave warning and gave and commissioned these, these prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk to the point where, where Habakkuk was frustrated out of his mind because they were just ignoring all the things that he was saying. God, God was more patient than ever. He's more patient than Habakkuk was. More patient than I would have been. And so, God was more patient than Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, maybe he's saying, well, God, when I cried to you, I, I knew you were patient, I know these things, but I just, I just wanted to know that you were working, right? You ever feel like that? I just cried to God, God, I just want to know 
that you see. I just want to know that you know about me. And we cry out to God and we pray to him. But you know what's amazing? A truth that we can hold on to, that God is always working. God is always working. Romans 8, I love the passage. It says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to, the, to his purpose. And it goes on, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for his all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Which leads me to the next point, that God is more loving than you think. Now, how do you get that out of this passage, John? Well, God is more loving than you think he is. One of my great friends, he called me the other day, he just finished building a house with his own bare hands himself for his family, his wife and five kids. And um, I thought I knew a lot about the Bible till I met this guy, and I'll never know as much as this guy. He, he's a pastor, he's a theologian, he's a scholar, and he's always digging deep into the orig original languages. And, and what's amazing is, the other day he said, you know what, I keep digging deeper in this specific spot, and I, I'm just amazed. I'm just in awe. I'm just in awe of God's love. Like I've grown deeper in the understanding of God's love for me. And it, it's even bigger than I thought. It's more than I can imagine. And it's changing, it's changing my whole life. I'm thinking, wow, you're one of the most like, spiritual, close to God people I know that understands God's love more than I do. And he's like, it's changing my life as I even get even deeper to understanding the, the grandeur of God's love. And and I have a, a bigger fear of God now because now I, I don't want to disobey God and the consequences that's, that's going to have because like, I want to love God more with my life. I want to serve him even more. I want to be a better husband and father and pastor and follower of Jesus. And it just was a challenge to me because I think that we should always be seeking to expand our understanding of the character of God that we already know. We're like, oh, I already know that God's loving. I already know that he's sovereign. I already know that he's you know, good. It's like, no, 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 no. We, we need to be continuing to grow and deepen our understanding. And the more that we get to know who God is, and the more that we experience Him, the more that we'll see God is bigger. God is bigger than we think. So, but how does this show up in Habakkuk, that God is more loving than we think when God's revealing, hey, this is the wicked champion that I'm choosing to, <laughs> to discipline you? And to bring judgment to you. It seems like defeat for Judah, right? It seems like, wow, this is the end. That's the last strike, strike three. You're done. But what's amazing here, and we see throughout the prophets, as God tells them they're about to go in, into exile, is that we know that one day there's going to be a resurrection. And God's going to restore them back <laughs> to where they were from exile. But in one day there's going to be a, res a resurrection, and God's going to mend what is broken. Listen to the words from Hebrews 12. It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God is treating you as a son and a daughter when he disciplines you, when he allows things to happen in your life where it challenges you, increases your faith to be shaped more into the, the image of his son. When I was in high school, I was having a time kind of like Judah, and I was running away from the Lord, and I was self-deceiving myself that it was okay, and there was this day when, after church, came home, after my parents had dragged me to church that morning, and I was kind of snippy to my parents, right? And my dad said, hey, go up to your room, I thought, I'm done with this. So I heard him coming up the steps to my room. I thought, I'm not dealing with this. So I had this giant window. I opened it up, jumped out the second floor, right, in my church clothes, and I just took off, all right? I was, I was this uh, athlete at the time, all right, uh, a long time ago, football player, captain of the team. Like, I thought that I was hot stuff, right? Football was like my life. That's all I cared about. It, it was my, my God, all right? My strength and my ability, just like 
the Chaldeans was, was my God. And I took off, and I, my dad's never going to find me. I'm going to be gone for a couple of days, all right, my teenage self. And so I go on this back mountainous road. I think my dad's never going to find me over here. All of a sudden, he zips up in his car, <laughs> this little sports car, and rolls down his window and says, get in. Just ignored him. No, I'm not getting in. Get in the car. Ignored him. Like, I need to take off through the woods here. But dad gets out of his car. He parks the car. It's on the steep incline. He gets out. He starts trying to convince me, hey, like, come back. I don't even know what he was saying. I was plugging up my ears. And all of a sudden, my dad he starts to have a heart attack. He crunches over. And falls on the ground. I thought, oh no, what have I done to my dad? He was going through some health stuff. He had prostate cancer at the time. I thought, I just gave my dad a heart attack. And I know my dad pretty well, so I looked over at him. And I said, Dad, stop faking the heart attack. He was faking a heart attack. He was faking it. I knew him well enough, and I thought, wow, this is not real. He said, oh, that's clever, Dad. You're faking a heart attack. I said, Dad, stop faking the heart attack. I'll get in. So I got in the car, and I went home with him. Because that helped get my attention. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing causing this kind of stress? And, and I learned that day, one of the things that I learned is I learned a little bit about the character of God. That God pursues us. Just as my dad pursued me because he loved me, he cared about me, he wanted what's good for me. That God is a God who pursues us. When we're running against him, he cares enough about us to come after us. He could have just let Judah go, but he loved him enough to, to pursue them and go after him. And there's this quote from George MacDonald. He says, there is no refuge from the love of God. There's no refuge from the love of God. We try to run away from God, but God's love is going to come after us. And our only true refuge that we have is in God himself who loves himself and gave himself for us. My last point, expanded perspective of God. You know, when we pray, sometimes God usually wants to reveal himself more to us. We see that in the Psalms with David. And prayer leads to a bigger perspective of God, of casting our eyes from our situation and ourselves to a more of a grandeur of who God is, his holiness, his majesty, his faithful love. And God is faithful whether we realize it or not. And we can have faith in God. Why can we have faith in such a God? Because He's a God who is faithful. Our faith comes from Him. Our faith is in His faithfulness. We can't increase our faith in Him without having a bigger picture of God's faithfulness. And Habakkuk, I think, he needed faith in this situation for what was about to happen to him next. Chrysostom, the church father, he says, Refiners throw pieces of gold into a furnace to be tested and purified by fire. But in the same way, God allows human souls to be tested by troubles until they become pure, transparent, have profitably graded from the process. Therefore, this is the greatest advantage that we have as Christians. So then we shouldn't be disturbed and discouraged when trials happen to us. We shouldn't retreat or lose heart when unexpected things happen to us. Instead, we should submit to the one who knows best and who will Test our hearts by fire. He does this for a reason, for the good of those who are tried. And may we trust him when bizarre, crazy, wild things happen to us. I was talking to a friend yesterday, and he was telling me how recently there was a change within his workplace. And he goes into this meeting he thought it was going to be a normal meeting, and there's his boss. Okay, normal. There's my boss's boss. A little abnormal. Something's going on. But then his boss's boss's boss was there. And he thought, oh, no, what's about to happen? And long story short, there was this change that, that they, where it totally changed his, the task of what he was doing, things that he had been, been working his expertise on for, for many years and, and becoming an expert at it. And now he would almost basically have to take several steps back to try to become an expert in this, this new realm, this new area that his, his bosses were telling him that is going to be the change. And I was amazed to hear about how he responded. 
Because his co-workers, many of them were frustrated, irritated. And he said, you know, I know I'm not going to change this. God is faithful. He's allowing this to happen. And what was neat about it was that his, the foundation that he had wasn't on his work being his favorite task that he liked to do. His foundation was in God and that God was calling him to this place and giving him an opportunity to be a testimony to those that work with him. Like, well, that, that may not be Babylonian coming to attack you, okay? But every day and every week, every month, usually we're faced with circumstances that are challenging. Like, God, why would you allow this to happen? And, and God calls us in, in all those things to trust God. He is more faithful than we think. And next week, we're going to continue the process of how Habakkuk protests for an explanation. God, <laughs> please give it an explanation of what you're doing. And he kind of is in denial, and he, he's arguing with God. But we, we can trust him because he is faithful. Psalm 119, 140 says, Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. God has a pretty good track record of faithfulness. And even if we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle, like Habakkuk did it, we can still trust him. We can still trust him. And God is faithful regardless of us, just like God was faithful to Judah regardless of Judah. Because God's character does not change. And until we see that God is bigger than we think, more faithful than we think, we will not be able to have the kind of faith that God is calling us to. When we see that God is immeasurably more faithful than we think. It will increase our faith in a God who is eternally faithful. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your servant Habakkuk. God, I pray that you would increase our view of your faithfulness this morning, despite circumstances and difficulties, that we would have a, a faith where we would live as, God, faithful citizens in your kingdom. So God, help us to see who you are, to expand our understanding of you. And this morning, as you listen to this sermon in a spirit of prayer with every head bowed and eye closed, I just wonder if you think, well, you may be saying, well, Pastor John, I don't know if I've ever really placed my faith in this Jesus and this God that you're talking about. Well, Jesus paid the price for your sin and he wants to forgive you and give you a new life in him. And that's you. If you're not sure that you've done it, I encourage you to find me afterwards. Talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about that. If you Christian there in your seat in a, in a spirit of prayer, maybe you would just spend a moment and ask God, say, God, I want to be in awe of your goodness. God, I want to be in awe of your justice, of your love and your faithfulness. And maybe you would say something like this, God, I pray that you would increase my faith. Help me to cling to you in dependence on your spirit to live a faith-filled life no matter what is going on. So there I'd ask you, what is God trying to do in your life? Are you living for the kingdom of God? And I would encourage you not to question God's, God's love or justice, but ask yourself, will I, will I trust him? Oh God, we, we all admit, God, that we all need a bigger perspective of you. So God, I pray that you would help us. Thank you, God, just for the hope, knowing that your intention for us when we go through hardship is restoration. And through the Holy Spirit, the power of your resurrection, Lord, that you can bring us back into fellowship with you and operating in your kingdom for your glory. So increase our faith, God, today for your glory. And God, give us the grace to wrestle with you. But Lord, give us the faith to fully embrace you. In your name we pray. Amen.